join us for a review of the new Honda E. Subscribe if you haven't done so far and now let's go. Everyone here on the Frankfurt Motor Show loves this vehicle. Why? Well, it looks a little bit like a Golf 1 and you cannot buy a Golf 1 anymore. And wouldn't you like to buy a Golf 1 electric? Well, this actually comes close to it. Just that Honda decided to go for this move. And I think it's a really bold move and it's a clever move. You can see here those round headlamps. They make the car very likable, you know, just friendly overall. And then a very clean and simple design with this one black panel the illuminated honda front logo from the concept did not make it into serious production because there are regulations issues in europe to allow that well what's this black panel here on top of the hood interesting this is the front camera and next to it there's a button right there and then you press it and ta-da there we have the charging possibilities when you park in front of a charging station or something ac in the top and of course the lower one is the dc charger and it's actually possible to charge up to 50 kilowatt hours, so pretty fast as for DC charge. Well, let's say fast enough for this small vehicle. Battery size is 35 kilowatt hours and the range 220 kilometers or 140 miles. 3 meters 92, 12 foot 9 or 154 inches is the length of the Honda E. So yes, it's really short and the turning circle is just 9.2 meters. That's also extremely narrow, so pretty cool to get along in the city. And it also has a good wind efficiency, for example, with those camera mirrors, so no physical mirrors, and they all come as standard. Whereas at Audi, you pay like a couple of thousand extras for that feature. At Audi, I was not really keen on that feature with the Audi e-tron. Let's see how they have a solution for the interior monitors for that. And the same also counts for the rear again with a rather simple design layout. And I think on the one hand, this car says, you know, like, cuddle with me, I'm friendly, I'm nice. But it still has enough of coolness effect that it doesn't look too friendly or maybe, you know, like childish or something. So I think everyone somehow can, you know, like this car. And I think that's also, I think this will be very successful price-wise, by the way. It starts about 34,000 euros, it would be a German reference price and a couple of thousand extra for if you go for a higher trim. Yeah, that's a little bit higher in the entry price than, for example, the Opel Corsa E or the VW ID3. It's also a relatively small car. However, they have more extra equipment already included. It's really exciting with the interior. Those door handles here, you push them right here and you open them like this and um, you can also push them back just easily so they don't feel that awkward. So it's actually quite okay. Then frameless windows. That's also, you know, something emotional. Definitely pretty cool. This has a living room furniture style. We see nice high class fabrics on the inside and this gray Scandinavian furniture style. So very well done that reduces the amount of black plastics at the inside of the doors and it's not, you know, that expensive to produce but it's a good interior build quality. I just love that and very slim those doors. Um, but here, of course, not too much space for the bottles. Then first look here, again, this living room design, I just love that, it's amazing. Here, wood is being used as a decor element, compact steering wheel, soon more to those screens, 12.3 inch wide screens. Then six inch for the mirrors, and you can see them right here. <laughs> here we go. So this is a different place to put the side mirror monitors than Audi does. Soon more to that when we sit inside the car, I'll explain it all to you. And now let's get inside. By the way, if my voice is not as beautiful as usually, um, please excuse me. A little bit sore throat because of so much you know, talking and reporting 
all those days from the motor show. <laughs> well, but here getting inside is pretty easy. The door opens fairly wide, so easy to get in and out. And you sit relatively low, actually, and it's, you know, it's a more open seating position. The seats are very comfortable. Again, living room style. You can also pump them a little bit up, then they're a little bit straighter, that's good. Um, if we put them all the way down, headroom-wise, that still fits with one meter 86 or six with one. Although there is this glass roof inbuilt with a manual shade and a beautiful bright ceiling that brings more light in the interior. Interior overview and again, another wow factor. First of all, everything is clean, then this living room, wood atmosphere, matte wood, no fingerprints. I don't see any black piano lacquer other than the frames of the screens, so pretty cool. Then you have a volume knob right here and a home button for the screen that you can also access it, you know, um, while driving a little bit better. Vents right there, for example, for your hands or so. Then the climate unit even has clicking sound when turning. So high quality here too. And I like that we still can control it while driving pretty easily. And then this was the one design flaw. But you can also say, oh, I now activate the seat, the, the, the seat heating always with my knee. <laughs> yeah, oh, I could do this all day. But then maybe in summer times and you drive the car and then maybe like have a um, left hand corner and then why is it so warm suddenly at 30 degrees Celsius outside? Yeah, um, but again, still nicely built. Then those two big wide screens and then there's the digital instruments and again you see all oh, those two side mirrors and this is a basic difference to the Audi e-tron. In the Audi e-tron, um, maybe Jonas moves on over to the left here for a second. Um, in the Audi e-tron, the screens were like here and this was really bad. You had to look down and you had to look to the side and this was distracting majorly. Here, your view is not like that distance, distant away from the front which is also uh, heated available, by the way, the, the front windscreen. And also, if you look, where would you look when you have the classic mirrors? That's also somewhat this direction. So, I would really like to test that soon out when driving, but it seems to be that it's not such a different um, direction from the look. So, I think it's a clever way to um, integrate that monitor right there. Or also, when you look to the right side here, on the other side, you can easily watch that. So I think they really thought about where do people look when they use the classic mirrors. And that is the best solution. Look at that Audi. Maybe better do it in that way. Also for the rear seats, you have those integrated handles. And even that, it really resonates a good quality. Then we have the same styling here. Almost 90 degree opening of the door to be easy getting inside and then again fabric soft cover on the rear doors inside this is a better build quality than we see with some premium cars that are 100k or something this is really amazing also isofix at the seats each there are two seats available of course that's totally fine and remember it's a narrow car where you can get along in the city very well and also the nice gray fabric with the bench that goes all the way through and I mean it's not the longest car I mean 3 meters 92 is really short but then again the use you know the whole packaging is actually quite good this is as I would be driving in the front seat I mean it's not the most comfortable seating position in the rear but you can actually for short drives drive with four tall adults that is exactly possible also the head clearance just can put a hand over my head so really impressed here too oh look at that interior lighting here with those four lights it's also beautifully done so yeah i mean of course they are bigger cars but um considering this is so super short it is reasonable space we have here on the rear so taking a look at the trunk everything feels very light and easy yeah you're a little bit limited here in width and overall the trunk is very limited got some spots for your charging equipment here this is just normal um, household plug because most of the time when you have a supply at home the normal household plug will be just fine you don't need the fast charging and so on so yes the trunk is where this car is indeed very limited and now to the conclusion to the Honda e one of the most interesting vehicles from this motor show iconic exterior design it's small it's narrow it's enough size wise for the city and it's a good package you still have enough space on the interior and a very thought out concept great interior quality materials the best we've seen from honda ever it's really something completely new they thought that one through from scratch 
a very modern interior also with those screens. Maybe a little bit screen overkill, so I maybe could have reduced that a little bit just. But other than that, very clever interior concept and this will also drive very sporty because with a low center of gravity, 50-50 weight distribution. Yeah, the car is of course heavy as all electric vehicles because of the battery, but still it will surely drive very agile. Looking forward to the drive very soon. Also, the range is enough for the city. It's nothing for, you know, long-range commuting or, you know, like, you know, when you drive like 50,000 kilometers a year or something. But for all other purposes, this one is really what modern car customers need, together with an iconic design. And I really think that this one will be one of the future EV bestsellers in this small segment. Or well, what's your take? Please leave me your comments and let's discuss here the Honda e. Join us for a review, a first one exterior and interior of the Volkswagen ID3. Subscribe if you haven't done so far. And now let's go. In the front you can see a very round shape of all, it reminds of the VW Beetle and this is also somewhat where this three name comes from. There was the Beetle, number one, there was the Golf, number two and this now here as a third very important significant iconic car. 4 meters 26, 14 foot or 168 inches is the length but the wheelbase is 2 meters 76 or 109 inches. And that means that the wheelbase is about 13 centimeters or 5 inch longer than one of the VW Golf, whereas it has the same length than the VW Golf. So, the overall length, like Golf, but the wheelbase here, like a Passat. That's very interesting. We'll have an effect on the interior of the vehicle. Wheels come with 18 to 20 inch. Those ones are the biggest one, 20 inch. Different stylings available. This one here is this aerodynamic styling. In the rear, you can see this black panel design. Then again, this new retro VW logo. And those tail lamps are pretty modern, definitely. But again, it has some kind of, you know, this typical head shape they have here in the rear. So it does not look like a very sporty rear wheel driven car. But I mean, the electric motors, they have instant torque, then this weight balance, then the low center of gravity. So quite possibly it will drive very sporty. Maximum speed, by the way, is 160 kilometers an hour. So that's about 100 miles per hour. That's of course not super high speed German motorway, but for most countries, this will be totally sufficient. Yeah, and for most German traffic situations as well. And, and now we have a different trim and different color for you. This one here in glacier white. Very interesting and I think hmm, it looks pretty pretty good in this black white trim, doesn't it? What's your take on that? Also this retro VW logo uh, somehow works very well with the white car then. And in the rear, when the car is in white exterior color, this black panel design also forms an even stronger contrast. And you can even better see this ID3 logo. The official writing is indeed ID.3. And, but here I think it looks a little bit strange because the dot is so close to the D uh, and then there's space to the three. Yeah, but you know, that's a minor detail. Um, detail? Beetle? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I personally would have wished if this car would have had a real name, you know, like the Beetle or the Golf. And talking about the different battery sizes here again in the cutaway model where you can very well see again how it's placed in the lower end of the vehicle. And here the rear wheel drive, this one is here as the electric motor. This is also the place where you can recharge the car. Talking about recharging, at the moment maximum 100 kilowatts DC. Later on there will be 125 kilowatt DC charge available and AC charging up to 11 kilowatt. And then there are three battery sizes actually, 48 kilowatt hours, 55 or 77. So those three sizes available and of course the price differs and Volkswagen promised that the entry price for example, the German reference is below 30,000 euros than with the smallest battery. And if you pick like 
the mid-range ba uh, battery and some trim and you might end up like 40,000, 40,000 plus something. Um, so yeah, it's something like a high trimmed Golf diesel that will be approximately the price region. And the ranges you can get from those batteries will vary about 330 to 550 kilometers. That's about 200 to 350 miles. this interior come inside this is an early prototype model so some finishes will be nicer than you see it at the moment if this one remains hard pack or will be soft touch we don't know yet we have to see about that leatherette inside here and the insert then some reasonable space here at the inside of the doors but not too high for bigger bottles then you can see a lot of buttons have gone those are rather those touch fields then for example for which light mode is on then you can see the steering wheel has a modern form or inserts right there like we know from the t-cross then a small screen for the instruments and the interesting thing it moves alongside with the steering wheel i'll soon show that to you those ones are the ergo active seats uh, beautiful seats here with a fabric uh, living room style gray fabric here then the brighter microfiber right there so visually a very nice job already and standard this car will also come animal free because they wanted to be a sustainable car. Also, it is CO2 neutral as far as it goes, as far as it is possible. So what's the concept there? Of course, there is CO2 output during production and they try to, for example, power the plants then with renewable energy and where you cannot, you know, go around the CO2, they have, for example, forestation projects, you know, where they plant some trees to even this CO2 out, um, out. So very interesting and good that they finally take such an approach, especially, you know, considering the latest background with the diesel scandal then. So in seating position, it's a little bit like in the Golf. Um, there's enough headroom. I'm going to 86 or 6 with 1 if you haven't subscribed yet. This one here with the panoramic roof. The other car we'll uh, show to you very soon does not have one. Um, electric seat control right there. And yeah, I mean, it's a standard compact size car seating position here in the front. But the basic overview first, here soft touch, a bright one at, um, at the top of the dashboard, then this LED ambient light, very beautiful. A simple setup, always with this 10 inch screen. It will always come in this very size right here. Again, you can see the setup here with the big screen and the rather small instrument, but you can very well read it because it's very close to the driver. Then again, the retro logo here at the steering wheel. There will be some commands here, for example, for the cruise control or for the volume also at the steering wheel. Then everything is, so to say, almost buttonless. Of course, you have the hazard lights right there, for example, climate hotkey um, for assistance systems that you can deactivate, maybe a lane assist if that's too annoying. And the temperature control will also be here that you can swipe here for plus or minus temperature or here also for the volume like this for the audio. By the way, although this is a prototype, it already has a nice door closing sound. Yeah, that's the Volkswagen finish as for that. Yeah, this one again is not ready yet. We have to see about that later in the final production vehicle then. But of course, similar styling. And when you take a look at the styling in the rear, you can see it's the same in the front. Nice here also in this high trim with a gray fabric again and the bright microfiber isofix at the outside of the seats, each on the outer seats. But you can see the bench is falling way backwards somehow. Hmm, what about the seating comfort there? We'll soon experience that. And you can already see from here two USB-C devices there in the middle tunnel, which is not a real middle tunnel, since this one here is the MEB building platform. You do not need this middle tunnel anymore, so it goes almost, yeah, it's a small step. It's, um, for example, often done, it was a suggestion by you, one of you guys, um, for structural ri rigidity. Um, so just a small step in the middle, but it's actually quite good because then you can move around here in the middle seats. The middle part is also actually quite soft from the seating, but a little harder from the back. So I can sit here as a tall adult in the middle, but more important, what about the normal seats here? And yeah, this is 
the space I would have in the passat, indeed, in front of my legs. So yes, it's actually true. Golf on the outside, passat on the inside. Yeah, this retro logo has something. Um, I found it quite cool. What about you? Tell me. So, then the hatch, there is this floor cover where below that you can, for example, store some charging cables. We also know that, yeah, it's like a golf style, definitely, and square dimensions. So what about those dimensions? The normal length of the trunk here is about 80 centimeters, and the width is about a meter, and the height here up to the cover is about 40 centimeters. And I have already flipped one seat, and to the driver's seat I would be driving, that one then is about 1 meters 55. And now I go around and also flip the rest. You can also see how the ski hatch could be applied right there. And then here we go with the maximum setup. Oh, I think I have the, the cover here. I haven't put it in properly. So the right side is a little bit higher. Yeah, that's the way. That, now it looks better. So this one then is the full setup. I think very well usable overall. Of course, you can also just remove this lower floor cover to have a little bit more height. So, different interior trim here also. For example, you can get different colors for the inside of the doors and also this panel here in white. Also, the steering wheel is available in white, but at the moment when you have it in white, it will also come in animal skin spec, so that's a warning from my side. Then here again with this brown contrast. Uh, but I think this dual color design for the interior is very interesting approach, definitely. Also, and again with the retro logo right here. Prototype software standings here in this display to so just to show you a little bit more variation how it can actually look like. And now to our conclusion for today with the Volkswagen ID3. Will it be as iconic as the VW Beetle or as the VW Golf? We do not know yet. It definitely means a lot for the company and I think this paradigm shift, you know, thinking about a CO2 neutral um, production, for example, being more environmentally friendly, being sustainable. This is also something that, you know, comes from the background. It also, in this case, has to come from top down. And this car is supposed to stand for that. Of course, we'll follow the development if they really stick true to their word, because that's also something which is very important to us here at Autogefühl. On the exterior, we definitely see some quotes of the VW Beetle. So it has some retro elements also fitting to this new retro style logo of VW especially then with the short overhangs, the long wheelbase, the car appears bigger than the Golf visually, but it's actually the same length, as I said. And indeed, it is true that it has an interior space of a Passat, especially a lot of legroom there in the rear. Not exactly sure how comfortable it is because the rear bench is like falling so much back backward that it would be one criticism point in the interior. The software and the infotainment was not ready yet, so we cannot rate that. So we have to do that at a later stage, but we of course keep you updated on that. But the setup with the small screen, with the steering wheel that always moves together with the steering wheel actually makes sense. Nothing is blocking your view. There will be a head-up display available, as I said, also. And the screen of the central infotainment is also actually right-sized. Hardly any buttons left. Everything a very clean layout. So this already looks quite promising. And on the one hand, they can use existing stuff like, you know, beat door handles or the door closing sound which is like very solid in the Volkswagen Corporation. Of course on the other hand they have to work on new stuff which hasn't been there before. So it will be very interesting if they can live up to this challenge. Again about 30,000 sold so far so basically all pre-sold pre cars which could be pre-sold are actually sold. So um, this is a first positive sign. Of course it will be very interesting if they can for example keep up with the sales of a Tesla Model 3. If you think about this, you know, German internal um, uh, competition, we recently had also the um, Opel Corsa E, the electric version of the Corsa, and that one, you know, was also about the same price in, in a somewhat entry spec, but with some equipment in, in it. But this one here actually is, of course, I mean the same size then, um, same sorry, the same price, but a bigger size, so you get more car for the money. So. Could this then be the German electric car for the masses? Probably yes, because they built so many cars on this very platform that they can also offer it at an attractive price. And this will be probably the most important thing about this vehicle. Battery sizes and range will be enough if you want so. 
It depends on your driving profile. If you don't drive so you know, long kilometers in one route, then you can also save money and go for a smaller battery. It's actually also more environmentally friendly then. And if you really want to you know, go all the way, you have to invest a little bit more money and that, of course, get a little bit more range. Of course, now interest to look to your feedback. Please give us some comments here on the ID3. Let's discuss this car and we'll keep you updated, of course, very soon with driving it. Join us for our first review of the all-new Land Rover Defender. Subscribe if you haven't done so far and let's go. Land Rover or Range Rover models nowadays all somewhat look the same in the front especially, but that's not the case for the Defender. The Defender got an own unique look, reminding us a little bit of those angular lines, not as angular as it used to be, yes, so we have some round shapes right there, but definitely still with an own front face. Also with those round headlamps right there, you can still get the 90 and the 110, this one of course obviously the 110, the 5 door version, but it does not correspond to the overall wheelbase. Here length is 4 meters 75 or 187 inches, that means it's a wheelbase of 3 meters and 2 or 119 inches. And the biggest technolo technology change is there's no rigid axle in the rear anymore, you have both independent suspension, this will give you more comfort, will also mean less off-roadish, but yeah, I mean, Nowadays you can build also good off-road cars with independent suspension. I think that's that's key. 3.5 tons for the towing capacity. And you can see here in the side profile, this again the 5 door version, pretty much upright, this typical angular Land Rover Defender design. So it also is a little bit different than again to the other Land Rover or Range Rover models. And let me give you some off-road figures. Approaching angle in the front, 38 degrees maximum. Descending angle in the rear, 40 degrees, but that rather accounts for the three-door version. 90 centimeters of wading depth, and here you can still get the big replacement tire here at the back of the car. Other than that, it's also very distinctive as for the rear design. For example, here with those squircle design elements here in the rear, as for the lamps. And of course, this door here will still open in this very distinctive way because the rear tire would be just too heavy to flip it open. So as for engines, the good thing is, whereas all the other manufacturers use strange nomenclature to hide their engine format, here you can really rely on the horsepower figures. So what we have here, we have p -half, we have also petrol and diesel. So there's a P300, that's also the horsepower figure for the petrol, a P400E with a mild hybrid, six cylinder. Then there's the P400E with the p half so the plug-in hybrid and then diesel a D200 and D240. And again, those are also the horsepower figures, so pretty easy to remember in this case. Now to the interior, right there, instead of the doors, we start right there, so soft touch materials right there, and here some screws visible, and this is also this off-road design element, so pretty fancy definitely, not too big those inside door pockets, and then this one is a special bright interior, this has a unique styling, um, I mean it's like fixed plastic, but that also adds some rugged character to the car, then again those leather red covers right here and there. Open boxes also again to remind of the old model and more visible screws. So definitely a different style than we know from 
other Land Rover or Range Rover models. Also some fabric inserts at those seats. Um, not sure if it's red or animal skin here. I don't have the overview of all the seating materials available yet, but there will of course be different one available. In the bright color, it fits the car very well actually. At least if you can then live with some stains later on. So this interior does have something which reminds us of the other models, but still has enough uniqueness to be an own Defender style. Getting inside, here this typical upright seating position. When sitting here, yeah, it is somewhat similar than if you would enter a Land Rover Discovery. Um, but that's not a bad thing, definitely. You, again, this command driving position. Pretty long hood, so... Um, but what is good is that you all have those upright windows. And so you still have somewhat a good all-around view. Interior overview here with this horizontal stress and a lot of cubby holes right there. The screen here is in demo mode, so we will see um, different stuff that can be displayed at the moment actually. Then the steering wheel can be moved up and down electronically and also a little bit inward and outward again. All digital instruments, they are in the middle part and you can see when they're shut off everything is just black or dark. Let's see if we can turn the demo mode right on again. Um, those ones here are not visible buttons, so to say. Um, they have clicking sound. There will be also buttons here for the cruise control. This will be illuminated then when the car is properly powered on. On the left side then, for example, for the volume control. Some of the materials I'm not quite certain of, so um, it's a very expensive vehicle and from some build quality stuff, I would expect then a little bit more. There we have demo mode again here for this camera, especially for the off-road camera, all around view. And you also can see the inclination and so on. This will be pretty cool. Now to the biggest advantage of the 5 door version. Yeah, of course, you can easily access the rear compartment. Again, the visible screw design element. Same as in the front, we also have those soft touch materials at the rear doors on the inside. And then some reasonable space here for the rear bench, because everything is built in an upright character. So you don't lose too much length, also as for the legroom and so on. Let's also test that. Let's get inside right here. And there's ample of space and probably also the best package for the Land Rover or Range Rover cars because it's not the longest Land Rover or Range Rover we have here, but truly one with the most legroom. So I really like that approach. Um, see here the lower floor raises just a little bit. Then you can add an infotainment system right there, or there's also a USB supply. And it's really cozy to sit here in the interior, also in a very upright way. Headroom is also plentiful with one with A6 or 6 with 1. Then let's open this rear hatch. Here we go with this side opening. Pretty fancy. And wow, a lot of space, square dimensions. And with a nice floor cover, we already flipped the one side. Of course, you can do the very same with the other one. And pretty rugged ground here. Yeah, I mean, it might be prone to scratches, yes, but I cannot get that up myself at the moment just like that. So, very interesting area right here. So, storage right there. And also, of course, you can use it all the way up to the total height of that car. Outside, you can see the car's definitely better but we also want to show you what's going inside the booth here at Land Rover because we have some more color variations here the shots won't be as clear just on this one here because this one is here on this floating water uh, platform <laughs> pretty funny definitely three door in this light green color but there are other colors exterior and interior available of course we'll be getting a little bit crowded right here but they can also for example see this golden paint this is a very interesting, unique paint. Not sure how many people will go for that, but just to show you that right here. This one and also with a darker or black interior. You can see here again the visible screws, but then on the outside car we had the bright one, this one here then with the all black interior. And it also has a black painted front hood. But I think the contrast then, you know, to the checkered metal elements here is not that big then when you have this black hood right there. Then there are more five-door versions on display. For example, here you can see on the top part there, this is the one with a side ladder. We know that from the old car and also with a top roof cover and you can put some 300 kilograms then on the top of the roof for real or more off-road usage silver paint and with a contrasting 110 hood sticker 
There we go. So, which color is your favorite here for today for the Defender? Well, with this five-door off-road display of the all-new Land Rover Defender, we end our today's review of this one here. Interesting, they kept a very iconic style also on the exterior. It's of course totally different from the outgoing model, yes, but it has an own distinctive style also if you compare other Land Rover or Range Rover models from the lineup. So I think it's a really interesting car and maybe a new competitor to the Mercedes G-Class for example. And the Jeep Wrangler is of course also a unique one, so very rare and unique cars there on the market. The good thing is because of this angular design on the exterior, we have a lot of space on the interior. The best package from all Land Rover cars, that's pretty cool, so you can use a lot of the space you have. Then there are also, for example, those new PHEV engines available if you want to go a little bit more sustainable. Sustainable materials, we have to see about that. Of course, abundance of cow leather use here on the display cars. The quality of the interior materials is sometimes very good. So if I like those visible screws, those are cool elements, all those rugged elements. On the other hand, there are some parts which are, you know, not living up to the price of the car, which is extremely high, 50 to 90K. And that's, of course, my biggest criticism, criticism point with the car. Yeah, the G car is also very expensive, but from, you know, this rather off-roadish car, I would also expect to be, you know, a little bit cheaper than a little bit more affordable. Off-road use will be also quite cool, so it will still be also among the most capable Land Rover vehicles. Also, if you think about approaching engines, and not only the five-door, especially about the three-door. So, a lot to discuss with this vehicle. Please join us there in the comments. I hope you enjoyed also this part here. Join us for a premiere review of the Porsche Taycan. Subscribe if you haven't done so far. And now, let's go. In front of the all-electric Porsche Taycan, we can see it does not look that much electric. You know, there are a lot of electric vehicles which try to look normal, so to say. And then there are other ones that say like, hello, I'm an electric vehicle. And this one is rather something where you say, yeah, it's a little bit different than, for example, the Porsche Panamera, which would come closest to it size-wise in their model lineup but definitely not screaming out EV. So more a normal Porsche style. And it looks a little bit sleeker definitely in the front than the Panamera. Also some 911 jeans, yes. And also some air intakes in the lower part. And yes, EVs do need some cooling, especially for example, for the thermal management of the battery. Four meters 96, 16 foot three or 195 inches is the length of the Porsche Taycan. And that means it's about nine centimeters or three and a half inches shorter than the Porsche Panamera. So yes, they somehow come close. The Panamera is also available as a plug-in hybrid vehicle, but this one here, of course, the pure electric one. Just the battery here then in the lower area to keep the weight very low at the center of gravity as well. This promises at least a lot of agile driving fun, although the weight is of course way higher than with the Panamera. This one here then is the charging possibility. AC charging will work on both sides. DC on the left-hand drive car here, DC on the other side. And if you have the UK vehicle, DC will be on this side. You slide it here again, and it goes back very interesting again i have to say i'm really delighted by how agile the design is although it's again not a small vehicle i think that's definitely a great design job also this light that goes all around the vehicle and of course there will be an additional braking light appearing when you hit the brakes and talking about braking porsche predicts that 90 percent of the braking processes will actually end up in the recuperation to the battery and just that 10% will be used by the real brakes. So yes, you will definitely save some real brakes. Well, since with EVs, we cannot show any engine bay and then talk about the power output and so on. We just do it right here and right now. Price here in Germany for the Taycan Turbo will be about 150K. That's pretty heavy, yes. But if you think about the Panamera with comparable power, that comes close then. 680 horsepower is the power output for this vehicle. Acceleration figure to 100 kilometers or 62 miles now is 
about 3.2 seconds and the estimated range WLTP cycle is 450 kilometers that would be about 280 miles. Well, when you reach the maximum speed of this vehicle, 260 kilometers an hour or 160 miles an hour, then those integrated <laughs> handles will do a good job aerodynamic wise. Other than that, the tactile feeling as we experienced in 911 is yeah, not satisfying. So uh, it looks cool, it's good aerodynamic wise, but just how it feels, hmm, not too happy about that. But again, it's the same as for 911. So prefer the old school style as for that. Then this one here has frameless windows, so coupe style, and then see it right there, pretty neat. And then everything as on the exterior, the Porsche design scheme is to wrap things tightly. That creates a lot of tension design-wise, the same is done here. Interesting copper tone here, or like rose gold or whatever, um, here for the door handles. That makes a good quality impression as well. Optional Bose sound system, then has a massive Taycan Turbo entry batch. And we can already see there are two steering wheels available. This one here is the GT one. Why? This one has the visible screws right there. So, yeah, a little bit more racy, so to say. Then you have this curved display. Soon more deals to all those display because this one is the display car. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Soon more to that. But here already the instruments have this curved, uh, curved design. Getting inside now. And it is actually quite low. So you have a sports car character. And from my first impression, this one to me is, from the feeling, a mix between a 911 and a Panamera. You know? That's how I would describe it. So um, the Panamera feels a little bit more voluminous, a little bit, you know, maybe more like settled and the 911, of course, maybe then a little bit shorter, more agile, but this one definitely something in between. And I would suggest that we maybe can also expect something as for that for the driving. We'll soon see more about that. So I have the seat in the lowest position. There is a panoramic roof here inbuilt and that's also the reason I have a lot of head clearance still to that. But then here to the A-pillar, it comes quite close. So you shouldn't move your head too far over there. So a low roof profile, but you can be just fine here also when you're a tall person. This is the interior overview and we can see it's pretty clean. Definitely here with those surfaces then here. This new screen here and well, again, one, two, three, four screens overall. This one, the passenger screen, is really for the co-driver. That one is an option. Other than that, the main setup is, let's start here, 16.8 inch curved display for the driver display. In the middle one, the digital speed, but this definitely all digital. Then in the middle here, this one is 10.9 inch and the lowest one here is 8.4 inch. Yeah, where to start? First of all, some general information. You can see it here, you get this analog clock, still, like in a sports chrono package. Very beautiful design needle that just belongs to the Porsches. Then again, the steering wheel is common ground, so to say. We know it from the 911 as well. Driving modes can be selected right here. Also, as we know from the combustion engine cars, with a little bit more boost in the sports mode, also Sports Plus, reducing the stability, co stability control and so on. This car will still have a real bias because you will get more power than from the rear engine. Well, yeah, and the same also as 911, those parts here, are blocked by the steering wheel. Mm, so you have to like, like uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, hmm, not sure about that. So, but other than that, it's a pretty crystal clear display and this curved function is also, let's say, quite decent. Um, on the steering wheel, you can change the volume here, for example. Um, you have some hotkeys here you can also program. And on the right side here, you can choose something in the digital instruments, for example, change the assistance systems. You can change through those instruments. 
what you want to hear, what you want, want to see. Here's, for example, the GPS map can be put in the middle. That's, of course, quite handy. And then the right side here, too, you could have sport chrono information there as for the lap times. You can see um, there is a middle tunnel, although there doesn't need to be any mechanical link between front and rear axle, actually. So um, the reason for that is... First of all, structural, structural rigidity, and also you have to put the battery somewhere. And the space you have then here, it's a low sitting sports car. So when you have like an electric SUV or crossover, you can just put the whole battery underneath the car and no one will care. But here with a sports car, you have the problem. You need the space. It's very low to the, to the, to the bottom. And then they have built in those, so to say, foot garages, they call it that way, that there are space left in the battery layout that you can still sit in the rear and does it work for me i mean the car is long enough it should offer enough space and it works here when i'm driving in the front as a tall driver yes um headroom wise to the middle it's no problem again because it's a fixed glass roof to the sides i do touch you know the side pillar you open the rear hatch with the car key from the inside of the car with the display or then here with the button at the lower end and it doesn't open all the way fastback style but rather like this but still you can access it very well it's a little bit shallow yes it's 370 liters you are somewhat limited you have a 12 volt power supply in the rear then this lower cabin is here for the charging cable so that's definitely a clean solution and in the front you have another 80 liters so, of course, somewhat limited. There will be the um, emergency triangle right in here. And then, again, some more space right here in the front. And now to our conclusion for today with the all-new Porsche Taycan. Finally, there is a competitor to the Tesla Model S by Porsche and also they're going more in a sustainable way. Yes, EVs are locally emission-free. Of course, the energy has to come from somewhere and there are also other raw materials involved in production. There are different studies which is like more sustainable now. It depends on, on the long run. We are pretty certain that everything will be electrified. It's just a question like, you know, how, or how exactly it will be electrified. But that's definitely a step in the right direction, technology-wise. And it's supposed to be quite efficient. Of course, in the driving review, we will find out if that's true. Exterior-wise, it looks pretty sleek, although it's not a small vehicle. It looks way, way smaller than the Panamera, just, you know, when seeing it live here in person, although it's just slightly shorter. So I think design-wise, a very interesting job. You still have some decent interior space, yes. Of course, the package overall is not good. You don't have too, man, too much, uh, you know, luggage capacity, and the rear is usable for tall adults, yes, but it won't win the price for the most practical car. Yes, it's more supposed to be a sports car and, as I said earlier, from the interior feeling, something between a Panamera and a 911, at least to me. That's, you know, how to describe it in, I think, in the easiest way. Interior also pretty cool that they offer a vegan interior, so because it really fits when you build an electric vehicle that's supposed to be more sustainable, then you also have to be sustainable on the interior. That just makes sense. And, of course, it also has practical advantages like staying cooler in summer and also warmer in winter when you sit on those race tech seats. So would we'll look forward to test this version also very soon and present it to you. And again, technology and performance wise, the figures we heard were very impressive. You can also compare them to the main competitor, yes. So pretty fast. How will it drive? We'll keep you updated with that. I really hope you enjoyed this first look with exterior and interior here. Please subscribe to us if you haven't done so far. And I hope to see you next time with a combustion engine car still or with our next EV review and latest when we take this one here on the road, which we're really looking forward to. The Audi RS7 Sportback is probably, maybe we can agree on that, the sportiest Audi just from the look. But what else? What about the power? What about the exterior details and the interior? Let's find out together on Autogefühl. Well, it's not a small car, but it just looks so sleek in the front. 
Yes, of course, also white, but sleek in a very sporty way with those accentuations on the hood and those headlamps here. They either come with LED as standard, and usually it would be the next step matrix LED and then the laser, but here for the RS, they directly hop from the LED to the matrix laser LED. And then you also have this blue ascent in there and also special for the RS, a dark background all around inside the headlamps. Very interesting. Stronger front grille, carbon fiber pack here with a lower spoiler and you have those glossy black paint all over the grille. And you can also get black Audi rings. You do not have to get them, but you can. The length is at 5 meters, 16 foot 4 or 197 inches and that's actually a couple of centimeters longer than the normal A7 just because of those strong spoilers front and the rear. The car is then overall a little bit longer but of course not chassis wise or something like that. Then here 21 inch wheels would be standard. Those ones are the optional 22 inch wheels, pretty massive. Of course, you will lose some of the comfort then. And there are also the optional carbon ceramic brakes. Well, boost up the price even more. We'll have aggressive braking performance and especially for track use. Yeah, track use will probably not happen with this car. People use it as an everyday driver car indeed. And there are also the air suspension fits to the vehicle. It's set on a sportier note and also a little bit lower, 10 millimeters lower than the normal A7 and it goes even more 10 millimeters lower when you're driving higher speed, more than 120 kilometers an hour. You can see this light strip goes all over the car, as well as the width, and also has a different form than when you look at it from here, from the A6 and the A8. They all have their, you know, somehow, somehow a different form. The A7 more goes like this, the A6 is more like straight, and the A8 more goes like this. So, like Audi rings, you can see it right there. You can also opt for brighter ones, I mean, also what another perspective, you can look at it all day. Technology highlight wise, what else is interesting? You can have a rear axle steering optional. So that goes five degrees in the opposite direction than the front wheels at slow speeds, 2% in the same direction at higher speeds to stabilize the car. And you can also get a sport differential lock here for the rear axle together in one dynamic package. Both in the front and in the rear, the RS7 is two centimeters wider per side than a normal A7, again to stress this width. So most of the parts on the exterior, like the very exterior parts, are really specific for the RS7. And then you can see here this very interesting floating spoiler with the diffuser style, also honeycomb structure inside, and in this case again with a carbon fiber package, but again, you have some other options for that too. RS7 badge right there. And then this exhaust, the outer tip is just, you know, for beauty, it's also a little bit exaggerated. I think the real tips are on the inside, but at least it's not a pure fake exhaust. This one here, the performance exhaust, the normal one has a chrome frame around it. And this one, you know, might sound a little bit different. We'll soon also again find out. Well, the Audi A6 sedan has more downforce due to the building form here with the A7 Sportback. It's actually, uh, you know, less downforce at the rear and that's why you have this additional wing that folds out automatically when you drive really fast. But when you just want to play around or show off to your friends, you can also press a button in the infotainment screen. So, whereas the S models get a 2.9 liter V6 petrol or a 3 liter diesel in Europe, yeah, the one with the fake exhaust. <laughs> Here, the RS model gets the 4-liter V8 bi-turbo petrol engine, 600 horsepower, 800 newton meters of torque, and the acceleration figures are 3.6 seconds to 1 kilometers or 62 miles an hour, and 12 seconds to 200 kilometers or 125 miles per hour. That's of course pretty massive. Combined with the converter automatic gearbox, all-wheel drive setup is 40% front, 60% in rear, then a little bit adaptive. Can put a little bit more to the rear, but also a little bit more to the front, depending on the situation. But definitely you have a rear wheel bias. My favorite for today is this Alcantara steering wheel. First of all, because it has a sporty form, also has a flat bottom and a very good grip with this microfiber surface. This sports seat here is standard. You can also get it 
with the Alcantara on the inside, what we would recommend. And this one here is the RS seat with the integrated head restraint. However, if you want more comfort, you can also get another comfort seat, also with Alcantara, for example, at least on the inside. A7 in general has this flatter A pillar already, so you don't have so much space in the interior here as you compared to the A6. But still, it's not such a huge difference. 1m86 or 6 foot one still have another head clearance right there. The interior overview, everything is really clean. Then you have this dashboard where you can maybe have breakfast or something <laughs> together with your co-driver. That would be a nice idea, wouldn't it? Hmm. Yeah, but you know, when I'm driving a car, there's no food in the car. Sorry about that. Yeah. What about you? Food allowed in your car? <laughs> Tell me in the comments. Nice quattro bed right there. It will also be illuminated from the LED ambient light. Then you have a 10.1 inch top screen here, 8.6 below that. They also play together. Soon more details to that. And the virtual cockpit here, 12.3 inch. And there's a new RS mode button right there. When you click it, it changes the virtual instruments and you can go to two RS modes. GPS right there. Look how fast this visualization approaches. Wow, it's really very cool. And you, know, you can also get a satellite view for it. Other than that, the main menu is in an app view, so to say, easy to learn. Phone wireless CarPlay is now available for this car also or other cable connection for the Android Auto or the Apple CarPlay. And oh no, we don't want any traffic information right now. And what else is interesting, definitely here this car menu where you have the RS monitor with special gauges, tire pressure loss indicator, or also the car temperature for the coolant or the engine oil. You can see different stages for that. And the G meter also has a big visualization here in the middle part. What else? In the Audi Drive Select, you can have different driving modes. Dynamic mode will lower the car with the air suspension, make it sportier even. Then you can go for RS1 or RS2 modes. And then you can have the different settings here for those modes. I really like it when the virtual cockpit shows the GPS map all the way. Then you can better follow it, definitely. But you can also change the view a little bit like this or have other information just in your line of sight. And with the RS mode, then you can check it out here. I have the big RPM meter. So this is special RS mode and then this RS1 or RS2. And then the setting will change the way you want to have it. And this is, by the way, the Apple CarPlay integration. So it uses most of the screen. I think the integration is quite good. Here on the left side, you have then also the hotkeys when you are in some of those menus. And the music with this Bang & Olufsen sound system is really cool. It's very in-depth sound, so to say, very crisp and clear. I can really recommend it. Nice. Well, here in the rear, it's somewhat cozy. Yes, there are more comfortable cars for that, but you know, you feel very much caged in around with this dark ceiling, especially in this case, Alcantara ceiling. There's some reasonable legroom left, that's okay. Of course, there are cars with better packages. Also because the rear bench falls backward a little bit, that gains some headroom and legroom, but doesn't make the seating position more comfortable. You have a sporty looking car, but then you have this fastback style and you can load things in and out as easy as with a true estate. That's a very interesting approach. Underneath here, there's just some you know, tire replacement kit and so on, tire repair kit. Then there's this you know, fixed cover. You can take it out completely. And then, very interesting, this net here, additional net. You can put it up and maybe to put things here that they don't fall to the interior breaking them. Usually when we do our conclusion, we still have a front or front three-quarter perspective. But with this one... I have to end with this perspective, sorry, <laughs> that wasn't necessary. So exterior, I think we can all agree, such a beautiful vehicle. And even with those very sporty accentuations with those, yeah, little bit maybe too extreme exhaust beauty tips on the outside, half fake, I would say, and those really large rims, it still looks somewhat elegant. And that's no, no, not quite often with those top sporty models. I would probably take less black and more the, you know, the chrome elements, just my personal choice. The red is also pretty cool, but I would also take a Thomas Blue, of course, for this car. The interior has a very good build quality. The touchscreens and so on, they are actually quite easy to learn and everything is very nicely visualized. However, you can always argue if while driving a central control knob is a little bit more practical and safer to use. But voice control now gets better and better. 
Although Audi, as for the voice input, is not as up to the game with BMW and Mercedes yet. Probably they will change something for the future models there. They have to, actually. Then the rear is uh, the rear and the inside is actually quite well to use still, considering it's a coupe-style car, but it fits still for tall people. And the trunk, actually quite astonishingly, that for such a sporty vehicle, you can easy load things in and out. So that's a unique selling point here, definitely for the seven models of Audi. Driving-wise, we can expect, of course, a lot of performance. Really looking forward to drive this one, if that really still masters sportiness and comfort. The S7 was a very cool ride. But of course, this diesel, 3-liter diesel power was, you know, somewhat good for everyday driving and a little bit lower, lower fuel consumption. This one then here, the true performance version. Let's see how that one plays out. What can they still do? I mean, they have a mild hybrid system and cylinder on demand, so cylinder deactivation technology. So that's something more towards sustainability. Will that drop the fuel consumption? Mm, I'm not exactly sure about that. We have to find out about that. Of course, on the interior, they need to use less animal skin. It's, you know, it's modern times and should be belong to the past, the same as street lanterns are not powered by whale fat anymore. But le Audi is also learning. We've seen that with the newer concept models. Other than that, I think it's a really fantastic car. I'm not sure if I would spend all the money for, you know, more than double the base price, at least for this one. Uh, so it will always be way more than 100K. Um, that's really a harsh price, so money shouldn't matter to you then. Uh, I really like a 3-liter TFSI. We've already driven that one. You can check it out, that review, in the video description. That is a really cool car and a cool combination. It will definitely be enough, and maybe this one, leave it for dreaming. Or, are you really intending to buy this one? Then put it in the comments. So let's discuss now about the Audi RS7 and tune into more episodes of Audi RS cars. Or, of course, also our full driving reviews with the normal versions. We have everything you need here on Autogefühl. Thank you so much for tuning in. Join us now for a full tour of the all new BMW X6. Let's go! The front is stronger than before and as with all recent new BMWs, the double kidney is even wider, especially in this case fits to the X6. Here with a special unique function that it can also be illuminated. You can check it out in our Venta Black episode where we could really very well see this illumination that is even allowed in Germany. Pretty interesting. The length is at 4 meters 93, 16 foot 2 or 195 inches, so slightly longer than the X5, but overall same wheelbase, same platform, approximately the same length, just a little overhang because of the spoilers. That's different to the Mercedes GLE Coupe, which is 6 centimeters shorter in wheelbase than the SUV counterpart, but BMW thought that doesn't make such a difference. Wheels come with 19 to 20 two-inch wheels, so only big ones for the X6. Those ones here are the biggest, actually. This is also the M Sport batch, so there's the M Sport line or also the X line when you want a little bit more off-roadish look. The M Sport line, of course, is somewhat standard here for the M50i model, the sporty one, also with those fake out attacks. In this case, they are shut off. Yeah, always about those rears of the SUV coupes, and as we've seen the Studio Venter Black color, this part you could not really realize. Now we can with the normal paint. You can see here how the design lines shape up there. It's not a simple or clear design. Um, definitely something to think about. The tail lamps are now more horizontally drawn. That's the difference to the predecessor generation. And the M50i also has this additional lip right there for a little bit more downforce in the vehicle color together with the M50i badge. This one here, the M50i, is that 4.4 liter V8 turbo petrol engine with 530 horsepower and the acceleration figure is 4.3 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. The smaller petrol engine would be the 40i, the 3 liter R6, so 6 cylinder turbo petrol engine, 340 horsepower, 5.5 seconds acceleration figure and then diesels for Europe 30D, 3 liter 6 cylinder, 265 horsepower or the M50D, the sporty 
diesel, three liter, six cylinder, same engine, but 400 horsepower then in 5.2 seconds in the excavation. So what about this front seat area? First of all, inside the doors, sensor tech leather red being used right there. It's a nice finish here. They stepped up the build quality if you compared to the predecessor generation. Hofmeister kink design element right there. And also an optional Bowser the Wilkins sound system with a really decent and nice sound. The M50i gets this entry batch and also sports seats. So there's a base seat and a sports seat available. Yeah, but then here in the XX, just animal skin materials, that's really not looking forward to the future in 2019. So the X5 also offers sensor tech leather red, which is more sustainable and animal friendly, but this one not available here for the X6. But the seat form itself is quite comfortable. M steering wheel here before the M50i that can also be heated. This is, of course, a great winter function. As for the seating comfort, X5 and X6 are not too different because different you know the, the, the basic forms are just the same steering wheel can be adjusted just like this electronically and the only thing is you feel a little bit more cramped in the x6 yes of course with one minute 86 or six with one you can still sit here still have some head clearance left interior overview we know it from the x5 it's the very same here in the front sensor tech leather red dashboard wrapped tightly great quality and soft touch bows and wilkins sound system with this bow right there there's of course an option then two times 12.3 inch and there's you know, only this size then so on the left side digital instruments also with the visualization of the x6 in the car right there and also in the very same exterior color like that they pay attention to those details that's cool shifting pedals at this steering wheel compact size good grip handle then on the right side also activation for the voice control or also with saying hey bmw that's possible when the car is properly powered the left side would be for the cruise control and also this you know highway pilot mode which is more sophisticated as it's more allowed in the us with more sophisticated functions what about that rear compartment let's get inside here first of all inside of the doors also with the leather red cover high build quality then we have those manual shades here for the kids yeah, there we go. <laughs> and back again. Also very nice quality as for the door handles in the rear. The, the rear door does not open too wide actually, so getting in and out is not, not too easy. And also for installing child seats and so on. Same styling as in the front. And there's also this pet holder available. Yeah, I'm not sure if you really need that. It's a possibility. Probably everyone will rather use his or her own personal device and crash safety wise hmm, I'm also not always convinced of that problem of the X5 and the X6 is the package as for the rear legroom um, you see I mean I have enough legroom yes and also headroom that works with one meters a6 or six with one so no compromise as for help yeah I mean the X5 does have more headroom in the rear but it works here um, the rear bench is also falling backwards a little bit more um, but then again, that's, you know, giving you more headroom and um, also the legroom. But considering the length of this vehicle, this is very poor legroom. So it's a bad package, so to say. But it's still enough space. If you compare it to the X5, you lose height in the trunk right there. This is the downside. However, if you compare it to a sedan, for example, you still have this fast back opening to be able to access it quite easily. This is the split cover. You can slide forward like this. And pretty cool is a hydraulic strut here for this lower cover and the additional case underneath. So that's pretty neat. Here on the side with a 12 power supply. And we can also flip the seats from here actually. And they do flip directly. So that's also very nice. And then of course you could also remove this top cover. The liter figures actually differ about 65 liters to the maximum and 135 liters to the X5. And that means the figure then here for the X6, the little bit, you know, smaller figure is 580 liters. And then with all flipped, 1525 liters. Why would you go for an X6 instead of an X5? It's all about the styling, definitely this falling coupe roofline. That's why those SUV coupes are being built. It is, of course, somewhat a compromise, but you can see you can live with a rear headroom. That's okay, also for tall people. 
and also the trunk area of course limited a little bit in height but still it's an overall very well usable car even you know for our family so that works here the m50i has a stronger stance on the road but altogether this new generation of the x6 is already stronger than before and this illuminated front kidney you should check it out in the other episode of the x6 is really very amazing and looks almost a little bit menacing in the front definitely so a little bit stronger in the styling also in general if you compare it to the x5 the interior has been stepped up as for the build quality if you compare it to the predecessor generation so that's a major difference more digitalized yes that's also a main change and you can very well control the car also with the voice input for gps destinations temperature and also whatever you want to hear hear or see so please thank you we're just on camera here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's almost uh, live on tape here on the motor shows. Sometimes, of course, just also funny for you to watch. By the way, I didn't mention that in the interior there will be a head-up display available as we used to from BMW. And at the moment, they're also building among the best head-up displays. So it's also an option that is um, pretty nice to keep your really your eyes or your line of sight on the road. Hi, we are live on camera. Thank you. <laughs> so interior then great build quality it's really a pity that they do not offer any sensor tech animal skin alternatives here in the x6 this one so far reserved for the x5 i think that's a wrong decision definitely other than that they've made a lot of things right with the car design is of course always a matter of preference the rear is really you know more playful than before whereas the side profile looks a little bit sleeker than the one of the previous generation there's definitely a lot of to, to discuss with this car. The PHEV will probably not come with the X6. That one will be reserved for the X5 so far, unless there will be a high demand. The 40i will be a very important engine for the, <laughs> for the uh, X6, especially in the US. And the M50i will surely also be quite important. The normal 50i will be phased out because when people went for the V8, they usually then directly went then for the highest horsepower spec then. So, a lot to talk about with the new X6. Which one would you go for? X5, X6? Or if you compare now the X6 with the GLE Coupe, we can also compare this episode and then would like to have your feedback, feedback GLE Coupe or the X6. Let's discuss this and please continue with the next Outdoor Food episode. Subscribe if you haven't done so far and heads up also to Jonas for camera work, even though we have you know, some disturbances on the motor show as usual. But again, that's live and authentic on Outdoor Fuel. See you in the next episode. The Audi A5 facelift S, S5 Coupe. Join us for that review. Subscribe if you haven't done so far and let's go. LED headlamps are now standard. They are a little bit changed also in the design. Some, some you know, minor upgrades here to the front. The S5 Coupe, of course, has those very sporty accentuations here inside the grille and also contrasting lower bumper. Length 4 meters 67, 15 foot 3 or 184 inches. And the wheelbase to the sport bag does actually differ. So the length of the sport bag is about 2 inches longer or about 6 centimeters longer than the one of the Coupe and the convertible. So this one here obviously coupe with two doors and this very central shape right there. You know Audi is working a little more with edges and strong angular lines than for example Mercedes does. Here in this case this is also a 20 inch wheels, the biggest ones available, pretty massive and they also have a special tire here with this overlapping lip to protect those precious rims a little bit more. In the rear slightly different design here for the tail lamps, looks a little bit more modern. S5 batch here since this is a sports version then the diffuser in the lower end black contrast and the TDI models for Europe at least for Coupe and Sportback they will have absolute blind fake exhaust tip on the right side and then on the left side you have those exhaust rings with the real exhaust on the inside when you have the petrol V6 those ones will be real exhaust. About engines in general for the A5 facelift still 2 liter TVSI or 3 liter TVSI then also available in the US, four cylinder, either with a two liter or a six cylinder, and then here with the three liter TVSI. And for the S5, 
For the US, you still get the V6 with 350 horsepower, the V6 turbo petrol engine, 4.7 seconds is the acceleration figure, 2 well kilometers so, or 62 miles an hour. And then also for the A5 in general, again, 2 liter tier TDI with a 4 cylinder or 6 cylinder 3 liter TDI. And in Europe, the S5, Coupe and Sport Big will be the S5 TDI, then also with about 350 horsepower, but then about 5 seconds is the acceleration figure. Now let's get inside. It is still a mid-size vehicle, therefore it's not too different when getting on the inside. If you think about an Audi A4, but the roof line here is a little bit lower. Still you feel quite cozy in here, a little bit less headroom. So I'm on with 86 or 6 one that comes quite close actually, so you feel a little bit more roomish than in the A4. Still you can find a good seating position. Steering wheel, sporty style with this round in the middle and an S flat and and so on you can control it with the manual control electric seats in this case and you know it's still decently comfortable and you have a sporty seating position yes but it's not too sporty that you would say uh, you know it cages you in totally it's super uncomfortable so i think it's good mix material wise by the way good quality here soft touch on the top board then there's some carbon fiber here as those inlets and all the buttons and so on that audi is using Nice clicking feedback also, so everything is very well organized. Yeah. Ugh. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. That's why I prefer the sport bag for reviews. So, uh, headroom wise, I do still fit in here. I do hit the head on the ceiling, but you know, just barely. It's barely okay. So, um, middle. Here with some cup holders as well. Fold them out like this. Two USB charging ports are, by the way, also in, in the middle part. Then we, you see here we have those glass roofs here. Um, this all can all, it's also be open actually, and there's also a shade. But now when I put the seat back, uh, yeah, well, for a short trip, maybe to the train station or so, it still works, of course you will be a little bit more flexible than with the sport bag. That's why people would go for the sport bag for also have, of course, the, the next door. But now Jonas gets here that we can have a clear shot to the front. I'll start with a 12.3 inch digital instruments here on the left side because, because the car is not really battery powered properly and it might dissolve <laughs> after a while. So, and they're crystal clear to read. You can also have a full map view in here. Uh, recently seen also in our A4 facelift review. Then a good grip with, with the steering wheel, although um, the one with Alcantara would be better. Sound control on the right side with the thumb, and left control would be how you control the digital instruments. And the big news is here definitely this 10.1 inch screen. It will always be that size. Thank you. Finally, not three sizes anymore. There will be software differences though, so um, they want to give, you know, still keep some extras. All via touch, um, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto connection is available right there. And also with the newer cars that are coming to the market now, also wireless Apple CarPlay, that's cool. GPS also looks pretty impressive, like this. It's also fast. We're here in Frankfurt at the Motor Show. So that's definitely an upgrade, but the GPS, again, will not be standard. You have to pay an extra to get this software. This one based on a new MIB3 infotainment system platform by the Volkswagen AG. You can still connect your phone via Bluetooth, by the way, and of course the home menu like this. Everything is pretty simple and clean. I really like this system. It's good to control. Yes, you have lost the MMI knob to control it, but you can very well access it also from the driver's area. Yet again, controlling the touchscreen while driving is not maybe clever, but you also have the new voice in input, for example. We could show you when the car is properly powered now. Let's check the trunk of the S5 Coupe. Of course, it will be the same for the A5 Coupe. The Sportback will have the Sportback opening, so 
will not be limited like this. This is the advantage of a sport bike, of course. Here you're a little bit limited in height, and the convertible will, of course, be even more limited. But here I can, you know, you can still live with that. And then you have those, you no, know, those folds here, like this for the middle part. And this here, this is just a release for the other one. And here, and then you have to go all the way around or push it from here. Oh, there we go. Yes. <laughs> Success. And with a beautiful three-quarter rear perspective, we close the Audi i5 facelift here with a special of the Audi S5 Coupe. Yeah, probably the sportiest one as from the look overall. The Sportback is, of course, more practical. And the convertible, the cabriolet, is, of course, to me, at least, always the most fun because it delivers you this open-top experience. Which one is your favorite of the A5 model line? Coupe, Sportback or convertible? Please tell me in the comments. The facelift, yeah, some fresh up in the exterior. The S models are a little bit more distinguishable now than to the other models. And especially for the interior with this new infotainment screen, it looks pretty cool. Yeah, the MMI control knob is gone. That might be a downside to some. Then again, you have a more sophisticated system, an easier software to control, and also pretty nice as for the big GPS you have there. So smartphone connectivity also has been improved and so on. So I think overall, you know, not too bad what they did there and it's really nice that they have refreshed it now. Also some significant changes we've seen to the A4. So the same of course A4 and A5, they are both on the same some would say, platform, share the technology and that's why also the changes are somewhat similar. So now tune in to the A4 face reviews for example and soon we will have also updated driving reviews here with the A5 facelift. What will be the future Mercedes S-Class, their top-of-the-line, top-of-luxury car? Well, it will be all electric and will maybe be this EQS concept, their next all-electric vehicle. Here as a preview for you here on Autogofuel, let's talk about exterior details and also a little bit about the futuristic interior. Let's go. In the front we can actually see three new design schemes. First of all, this very round shape. It looks like, like a raindrop, so to say. Of course, this will be really aerodynamic. The second thing is, here are those small Mercedes stars, which do not have the ring around the Mercedes stars here in the front grille. And the third is, they play more with the light signature in the front. They actually here have about 1,000 LEDs, 1,000 single LEDs. First of all, those greeting lights here in the front. If this all will be street legal or not, that doesn't play a role at the moment. They first want to showcase what they can actually do. And this EQ mask, all the new EQ models have this special black panel mask. And those ones here are holographic LED lights. So they look a little bit like the normal structure looks at the moment. But it's just, you know, projected into this light. Therefore, it's also flickering at the moment. So very interesting approach right here. And of course, absolutely different to a current Mercedes S-Class. So the design here in the side profile we can see they called one bow design because there's just one bow across from the front up to the rear and I think that makes it indeed sensual, beautiful and also clean from design and you can see here light is splitting darkness from light. That was you know very legendary right? <laughs> then also those non-real mirrors, so they are also those camera mirrors, not too keen on this technology, but I mean, concept car. 24-inch wheels, really massive, of course, too big actually, and you can see almost no overhang, then a massive long wheelbase to give you all this interior space and use the electric building platform, putting the batteries in the lower end. They say it should have an electric range of about 700 kilometers. That will really be true. I'm not sure, we'll see about that later. 
and 470 horsepower to give a really boost for 4.5 seconds to 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour. So and then this chrome span over the top part and really strong shoulders. So it is not a classic sedan, it is not a van, it's like a low sit. Yeah, what is it? I mean, is it a new segment? So really interesting. I want to know what you think about this design. And this raindrop design continues here at the rear. Everything is seamless, so to say. And again, those Mercedes stars, the small ones without the ring around it. Of course, you will still have the classic logo and it says Vision EQS because this is not the final EQS model. But it will come actually quite soon, the EQS. Just the question is if it will come in that way. It also depends on your feedback. Mercedes will read your feedback and then maybe decide which parts of the cars they do take in that way and which ones maybe not. In the lower end you have this somewhat diffuser style, but of course no fake exhaust tips because this is an all-electric car. And I think it can actually be timeless, the design, because the less design lines you use, the more timeless a car is usually. And the glimpse at the interior, we cannot see it from the interior for real because we cannot open it, but we can always see here the illuminated interior that looks pretty spectacular. And also how the form is inspired by yards, so by expensive boats. Also some kind of living room atmosphere, floating lines and bright materials. And also very sustainable ones. This one here is for Mercedes the pinnacle of luxury and in this segment they will offer an animal free interior so there is microfiber dynamica from recycled PET bottles and also the article leatherette in a high grade that you cannot distinguish it from anything else and for example also the roof liner which you also cannot see that well here at the moment fabrics on roof will be from recycled ocean plastics so doing something for the environment there too really cool concept and this really brings the brand to the future and even the wood that is being used is homegrown maple tree so also from sustainable resources which will be regrown and so on they really thought about this to make an electric vehicle all sustainable all around and I think that's a very important approach and it's not only that it's for lower end vehicles they really put it here to the top of the line this one is the new electric s-class of the future and this really, you know, means a lot to me, definitely, and it will in future then also mean a lot to Mercedes to make it full circle also for a CO2 neutral production, for example. What do you think about this interior? Please tell me in the comments. So we gave you a quick tour on exterior and interior. It's of course a concept yet, yes, but I think it shows where the design is heading. More floating lines, more round structures again. Interiors will be more sustainable and more living room alike inspired by furniture or also inspired by yards. So more about this experience we have in the interior. And definitely, designers will play more with light, both on the exterior and the interior. On the exterior, there are of course more regulations as for that. They have to you know, bring that through governmental proofs. But definitely light will play a more important role in our everyday car lives. Well, soon I'll telling you more about this car as soon as there is a further development stage. Just keep subscribed here on Autogefühl and we'll keep you updated with the development and I hope you already enjoyed this first insight. Join us for a review of the Mercedes GLE Coupe in this new generation like this or also as the AMG 53. Also subscribe if you haven't done so far and now let's go. In the front, GLE SUV and GLE Coupe are pretty much the same. It always depends on the trim version, on the engine version. So you either, for example, get this diamond pin grille. But here in this 
53 AMG version, you have those vertical fins here, definitely stronger and also stronger in the lower areas, everything looks sportier. The length is at 4 meters 94, 16 foot 2 or 194 inches, that's 4 centimeters longer than the predecessor, but now it gets interesting. 6 centimeters less in wheelbase here with the Coupé than with the GLE SUV, and that's pretty unusual because you know, that means higher costs in production. Usually they keep the wheelbase for those two versions. So very interesting. Must have been some engineer who really wanted that, that the GLE Coupé is a little bit more agile. Interesting. Wheels come from 19 to 22 inch. Those ones here at the top, 22 inch. Usually the AMG 53 starts with 20 inch as standard. And then optional, optional, the 22 inch. Pretty massive. And here also with the red brake calibers, bigger brakes, of course. In the rear, we can see that those tail lamps, they are more horizontally drawn. It's a contemporary design trend, definitely. But again, I think it looks a little bit less bulky in the rear than the predecessor generation. But of course, I mean, some who don't like the SUV Coupés, they always criticize, you know, this big fat end of the vehicle but then again you know also with the small spoiler here it definitely looks also sportier than the SUV and also with this very very flat window the AMG version gets the bad here then of course more dramatic lower end with this central diffuser and well those exhausted they looks nice but those ones are again just beauty tips so yes dun, 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 fake exhaust alert on auto fuel <laughs> so when you look inside then you can see the real ones so about the engines here for the GLE 53 always by the way cool here with this carbon fiber um, stiffness bar this one here a three liter six cylinder with 435 horsepower and the acceleration figure is 5.3 seconds to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. So this one here, the Mercedes AMG GLE 53 Formatic Plus Coupe. That's the official name. And then there's also GLE 450. That's three liter six cylinder. Also same engine basically with 367 horsepower, so a little bit less. In the front here, the new GLE Coupe as the non-AMG version. You can see here, this one, for example, is the 400D. This one got the diamond pin grill and then this horizontal fin so it always depends on the version you pick black indeed is one of the preferred colors for the gle coupe it somehow fits you know the whole style of the car yes but i think you know especially down this artificial light the white was a little bit cooler wasn't it hmm, i'm not so sure what about you this one here is the 21 inch wheel so we had the 22 with the 53 this one here 21 gives a little bit more comfort but you can also just stick for example with a 20 inch that will still look good and give you even more comfort so you will lose comfort of course as always with bigger wheels this one also with this side step here in black of course it's a bigger contrast then and then again look at this falling roof line here which is really a little bit different than here in this black color it's not the darkest of black we've seen that one with the special edition of the bmw x6 and yeah i mean they came on the market now at the very same time the new x6 by bmw and also this new gle coupe so of course if you're more interested in the x6 you will also find it here, find it here on our channel and this is how it looks like in the rear with the GLE Coupé if you do not have the AMG version. Here is the 400D for example. Lower part is also separated. You can see here manufacturers do that with the Coupé SUVs. They put the number plates in the lower part that looks a little bit more prominent in this area. And in the lower part then we have different fake exhaust. We still have this diffuser but we have a, you know even more fakish exhaust because this one is really nothing. <laughs> Insert of the doors here with carbon fiber inserts, optional Burmester sound system, delivers really a very nice sound, definitely. Reasonable door pockets here also for bigger bottles. Then here we have an illuminated AMG entry badge. 
There we go. Also carbon fiber inserts or inlets right here. Then you already get this two times 12.3 inch dual uh, widescreen screen. Sporty AMG steering wheel, flat bottom, then those ACC controls are integrated right there. Then we have those controls we don't like so much, to be honest, with those screens for suspension and here for the driving mode settings. Well, it's easy to select, but quality-wise, they don't resonate the rest of the car always, I think. Then the AMG 53 always comes with sports seats, so with bigger bolstering right there. And usually the standard would be the typical great AMG mix with Dynamica microfiber on the inside, like here, it just looks like this, but all over the seat then. And then the outer then, the Artico leather red, so that's also what we recommend. This one here is an option, the special red accentuations and more animal material. But again, you can also go animal free and then, then you also still have the sport here and yet more sustainable seat. Well, um, one means 86 or six with one. Yeah, subscribers will know. If you don't know, you haven't subscribed. So please subscribe to this and also to our other channel. Then, headroom. That still works, although this is the panoramic roof in here, so you don't, don't have to go for one. This is the interior overview. You can see here the 53 model got those red contour stitches right there. Then we have those four horizontal air outtakes right there. Still this AC unit, nice clicking sound. So you can control it while driving. Then two times 12.3 inch screen. This car is not absolutely properly powered at the moment. There we can show you everything. But if you're more interested in this screen setup, we also have a GLE full review where we also tested this augmented reality function for the GPS and so on. We will also link that review. They can check it out. But overall, a quite central cockpit layout, not too minimalistic. So again, Mercedes really wants this design focus. And also redundant controls, for example, you have the touch screen right there. So we have touch on the right side, left side is not touch, but you can also control everything with your the, with the right thumb. That only works when you have the next um, ignition phase, by the way, activated when you would have the key in the car. Then you can also control with the right thumb this screen and that screen then with your left thumb. So here now the rear, Jones just first shows you it like this, also with those carbon fiber inlets. And then you already see you have a little bit less space than in the SUV, but since this one is also the new generation and is a little bit longer, you have a little bit more space than in the predecessor coupe. That at least. Yeah. Same design as in the front and when I now get inside, which is still quite easy, so not much of a problem here. Well, legroom wise, although this one here has a shorter wheelbase than the GLE SUV, that's still quite good. So no problems right here. Um, the thing is, this rear bench that was the same in the SUV version, it falls a little bit backwards. So I'm not too keen on that on long for the long-term comfort. But again, this you know backwards falling rear bench gives you more legroom and also more headroom. So when I lean backwards, I do still fit in here. I can even put a hand over my head. So yeah, I mean quite slim as for the seating there. So, I mean, for four tall adults, it's actually no problem in here. So, um, I think that's good as a result. You, of course, still have a little bit more headroom than in the SUV. But then again, why not? Well, what about this trunk capacity here? We flipped this VW, uh, Mercedes logo. And then the trunk opens. Small step right here. Then you have some space underneath. Also option for a replacement tire. Well, of course, you are limited in the trunk height right here, just in the ending. This is the the big difference to the Geely SUV. Oh, you can also lower the car a little bit when you have the air suspension, like here in the 53 model. And then there's this top cover, which is a manual control, and it folds like this. Yeah, I'm not sure what to think about it. You can also just like pull it and then remove it completely. That would also be possible. But you know, hmm. not sure what I was sure to think about it yet. What do you think? Well, and the leader figures here, they are a little bit different to the SUV. So this one here is 655 to 1790, whereas the SUV is 825 to 2055. So you lose about 200 liters each, something about that. But again, I can still live with it. Now to this interior here, I'll show you some more variations. It's like a black and white scheme interior. It's a couple of thousand euros extra trim here with this leatherette there, the inside of the door, soft touch and so on, that's cool. And again, this optional Boymaster sound system. But those seats here also in the white black trim, whereas in the A-Class platform cars, like 
GLA, GLB, A class, and so on. This trim here in the black and white is also available with Artico MB Text Leather Red. This one here is the animal skin spec. But also for the GLE, they offer more sustainable materials. A lot of different Artico MB Text choices, so the Leather Red choices, in different colors actually. So plenty of different colors available here for the GLE, even though if you're not interested in the animal specs. Well, when the first SUV coupes came on the market, I was thinking like, what? Why? And that's really ugly. But now, like the second generations of those SUV coupes, I think are a little bit more likable. They're a little bit sleeker from design. The designers really try to improve this line. And yeah, of course, the SUV versions always make more sense if you think about, you know, practicability. But then again, an SUV coupe, as for the practicability, still makes more sense as the sedan version, for example, of a, of a vehicle that would be the same length. So we've seen also in the trunk that you can still very well use that one. Yeah, so I think it's just up to you and let's say, you know, traffic size or consumption wise, it doesn't really matter if you take the SUV or the coupe. As I like to transport some bicycles also in the rear, I would still go with the SUV. What about you? Would you take this one here, the GLE, also as a coupe? Here, of course, it also depends on driving because of the shorter wheelbase. Will it be that more agile than the SUV? Of course, we will find out here on Autogefühl in our driving review, which will come at the, up at the later stage. Or if you watch this video at the later stage, after the premiere, maybe the driving review is already online, then it's always worth to browse our channel or use the YouTube search, Autogefühl, Mercedes, GLE, for example, then you'll find all the content. So exterior-wise, pretty strong in the front, definitely. This line, a little bit more, uh, more elegant than before, and also stronger stance overall. Then in the interior, this new infotainment system, this is definitely the highlight. Also, step-up build quality, if you think about the predecessor generation. What is interesting, by the way, also as for the build quality, yes, you maybe heard it, for the GLE in general, for the SUV mainly, there were some quality issues, especially with some materials that were actually bought from suppliers. And um, there were obviously some wrong decisions in the management to maybe, save costs and so on. And, but now they are then in Germany and they're getting reworked, those cars that were originally built in the US, so they can actually maintain the quality. And then they promise that they are at the quality as they should be. Yeah, that's something that costs um, a lot of money. But I think it's also a good and transparent choice to tell the customers and then also to rework the cars if there is something wrong. When the GLE Coupe is being bu um, built, that's supposed to be changed already. You know, this one here, GLE Coupe and also the GLZ, GLE SUVs, those are actually American Mercedes from the US plant. Then, drivetrain wise, we also showed you some variation here today. For example, with the 403, we also explained all the engines in the part with the 53 version. This one, of course, will be really powerful. A PHEV is also announced for the Coupe, even. But we'll first show you a PHEV version with a GLE SUV. But again, still think that the GLE SUV will offer a little bit more flexibility also as for the drivetrains. This one also only with the stronger engines, not with a very, very low entry version. But I think you can understand it because a coupe SUV will always remain somewhat in a niche. And of course, the big question here too, would you take here the GLE coupe or would you go for the X6, the new generation for, from BMW? Also check out those videos and also let's discuss this in the comments. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please subscribe if you haven't done so far and see you at more IAA Motor Show episodes or of course at our driving parts. Thank you. This is the Mercedes GLB S 35 AMG. Please subscribe if you haven't done so far and now join us for this review. Let's go. In the front, although it's a family SUV, the GLB already has a strong look and especially here in the AMG version, those vertical fins here in the front grille looks really menacing and especially in the lower end here with the contrasting silver. Headlamps start with halogen, then optional you can get LED and optional optional the multi-beam LED also with 
the extended high beam function that you also see here. 4 meters 63, 15 foot 2 or 182 inches is the length of Mercedes GLB and that was a little bit strange because everyone was thinking, hey, it's between GLA and GLC, but it's not. So it's just slightly shorter than the Mercedes GLC, almost the very same length. Very interesting. And then this one here is the AMG version. 19 to 20 inch wheels and those one are indeed the biggest one 21 inch and of course car sits a little bit lower usually you get a normal suspension then you can also optionally go for an adaptive suspension and this one here comes with the adaptive suspension but in an amg amg setting which is a little bit stiffer still with those crossover wheel arches and you can see the whole car sits lower and wow i mean I think the GLB is really a very interesting car because, you know, exterior dimension and interior space, you will soon see, see that. But then again, to me, it's not the most beautiful of their SUVs. And then as an AMG version, I think in the front it works very well. But here on the side profile, sitting so low, it looks a little bit, you know, like aftermarket-ish. I don't know. What's your take on that? Not and now to the rear. And I think here again, it works somehow to have a more aggressive styling pretty much straight hatch alike then we have the silver contrast right here modern tail lamp yeah I mean why not and then the lower part of course a little bit stronger and those ones are pure beauty tips dur, dur, fake exhaust alert again so the real exhaust are well you can see them through that one in the inside then the strong diffuser but again front and rear works pretty well also as the AMG version so what do we have here usual for the GLB Two liter four cylinder engines, both diesel and petrol aside, so different choices there. And this one here is also two liter four cylinder turbo petrol engine, in this case 306 horsepower. We also know that from the A class of 35. 5.2 seconds is the acceleration figure to 100 kilometers or 62 miles an hour. Yeah, pretty strong for such a car. Also with this AMG design here. Of course, this one is not this concept, one man, one engine. It's more stock engine-like, but definitely AMG power tune. Then interior, they can use nice leather red here in different colors available. It looks like animal skin, but it's not. Then also here at the inside doors, you control the seats. Also galvanized handles and so on. A lot of space at the inside of the door. And then, as this one is the AMG version, you have an AMG entry badge right there. You also have, as from bigger AMGs, this flat bottom steering wheel. Then with those driving modes selected on the right side, this will be illuminated. Left side for the suspension. Right side, you pick up the phone, voice control, and the thumb control. Left side for the ACC. Then also soft touch at the top of the dashboard. Then there's this dual screen setup. Soon more to that when we talk about the um, all interior from the other perspective. Those ones here are animal skin seats as far as my research goes. But the GLB does offer a lot of choices, different colors of Artico or MB Tex leather red. And we've shown you also in the other review where you won't believe it's um, non-animal based, really high quality also available. And also for the AMG would be standard Dynamica microfiber on the inside and Artico or MB Tex leather red on the outside. This is a panoramic roof in here. Still I have enough headroom with 1 meter 86 or 6 foot 1. This one is also permanent roof. The car is not powered, but this can also be opened. And you got a nice upright seating position here, more comfortable in other than other A-Class platform cars. Interior overview, yeah, it's basic A-Class platform, so we can also see it on the interior. Just this one is new, this cylindric form as an additional decor element, and then those spectacular round vents. Also with nice clicking sounds and the base would be 7 inch screens left and right and then optional both sides you can upgrade to 10.25 inch as you see it now and then it forms also this two horizontal units. So left side you control with the left thumb usually then the digital instruments car not properly powered at the moment then we will also have some interior screens right there. And then the right side you can use via touch it also has this new MBUX system where I have this Hey Mercedes voice activation drive me to berlin not sure please start drive me to berlin not sure if it's working at the moment let's see so you can have drive me to berlin
And yes, I'm holding the microphone there because there's a speaker right there. I will first test the rear bench here for you because, I mean, when you buy this one as an AMG version, yes, you want to have some fun, but you still primarily maybe buy it for the family or something. So all the way back or like this, all the way forward. And when you have it all the way back, massive amounts of leg room. That's pretty cool. Really amazing. That's the big advantage of this vehicle. And then you can put it all the way back like this or a little bit more upright, just, you know, as you like it. And well, and then of course, what about getting to those sixth and seventh seats? This is, of course, really interesting. You do not have to get them if you want a rather clear trunk, so to say. You can also go with the five-seater version, but you can also go for the seven-seater version. Hmm, does it make sense? I mean, not so sure about that, but maybe you are seeking a seven-seater and then you can get one from Mercedes now, one that you can actually... Well, Mercedes is always expensive, yes, as a premium vehicle, but this one, of course, less expensive than most of the others ones. Jones takes the first shot and then you can see you can get in there and those are the sixth and the seventh seat there. And it really depends on also how is the front bench organized. And let me check it out. So when I get... Now it's Thomas workout starting, always when they're five or seven seaters. So I could still sit the way uh, like this. Then I go around. So come on guys, this gets really exciting now. Yes. <laughs> Getting here. Oh, the suit doesn't like that that much. My tailor will be watching this and saying like, Thomas, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so, so let's say, um, well, first of all here, sitting here oh by the way this is here you know life and auto fuel this plastic cover this was hopefully going off but you can just push it on again just that we're showing it it's everything is authentic here well pushing up the head restraint i can sit here although it's a little bit cramped i do exactly fit yeah i put my head a little bit back i do hit the ceiling but i mean it could work for shorter routes could theoretically let's see um now I would be in the seat where I could still sit in front of that and it could directly work. So what about the trunk area here, electric hatch we got. And then this is a setup as a six and seven seat would still be up. So just, you know, minor space left, some cubby hole underneath. But then, oh, that's the other way, yeah, like this. This is a nice solution here, the red handles and then they flip automatically like this. So. Um, if you have the five-seater, there would be still some storage underneath here. You can check that out in our other review episode. We already have from GB. Oh, USB-C device chargers also in the two, actually, in the rear for the six and seven seat. Nice that I thought of that. So, and then we'll flip this one here again, like this, and go the other way around. And then, wow, I mean, this is pretty cool. And those square dimensions really help you. Thinking about putting mountain bikes inside, just remove the front wheels, put a blanket over that, and then there we go. And that's also reason, I mean, you can do a lot of things with that car, and that is really massive. So, for this one here, big thumbs up. And now to a conclusion for today with the Mercedes AMG GLB 35. Yeah, not 53. That would be probably a little bit too strong for this car. <laughs> well, but what's your take on that? A performance version of this family SUV, you could say why not, why not having fun and still offering a lot of flexibility because the ratio of exterior space and then what space you have on the interior is really good and therefore I also really like this vehicle. Yeah, it's not my favorite as for design from the side, but I really like it in the front and also in the rear, just the side profile, especially in the AMG version. I don't know, maybe it will grow on me, but so far first look, I'm not too excited about it. But driving-wise, it will probably be sc scoring quite well. It has a longer wheelbase than a normal A-Class, yes. But then again, it's still not such a long car. It's also pretty light, so this can actually qu work quite well. Also performance-wise, we're looking forward to test that one. The interior is really a great thing. It has a good build quality. They have great animal skin alternatives, which are really high class. So, and even seven-seater option in an AMG vehicle. I haven't seen that yet. Now it's there. What do you think, guys? Hope you're also tuning in to other episodes here from the IAA Motor Show. 
And of course, also, if you haven't seen the initial episode we've uh, done with the GLB with a non-AMG version, you should definitely check that out. We always link interesting videos which are related to the current video in the video description and also in the pinned comment. Thank you. This is a first review of the Ford Puma. Let's go. In the front we can see a Fiesta resemblance, yes, but it's put a little bit higher in this crossover style. And what a beautiful Thomas Blue color here. My favorite color, definitely. That's why we call it Thomas Blue and Auto Gefühl. By the way, always subscribe to our channel here if you haven't done so far, then you can join us for the newest reviews. This one is the ST line. There we have a sportier style here with this black front grille and also stronger lower bumper. So the ST line definitely fits that one very well. So then it comes a little bit closer to the initial old um, Ford Puma. We also love their definite design wise. Was also a small design icon. The length is 4 meters 19, 13 foot 7 or 165 inches. And the interesting thing is it is about 18 centimeters longer than a smaller Ford EcoSport and 33 centimeters shorter than the bigger Ford Cougar. So the Puma is indeed in between the EcoSport and the Cougar. So why not? I think that's also a wise decision. As I said, on the Fiesta platform, this ST line here also has a batch right there, sporty style with a lower bumper. This one also gets a sport suspension. You can also get a base suspension, of course, SD line then with a sport suspension. If that one can be recommended, we have to wait for the driving review to tell you more about that. Ford also went a little bit more daring at the rear here with those three-dimensional tail lamps, also with this transparent glass cover. That looks pretty fancy. Big Puma logo. Then the ST line again with the sportier lower bumper and glad they did not go for any fake exhaust. Ford calls this honest design and we can agree to that. So this is also on the other side, uh, you know, pretty nicely covered real exhaust tip. So under the hood we have a one liter three cylinder turbo petrol engine with 125 or with 155 horsepower and then as we see right here with a mild hybrid concept so we can have you know, at some recuperation at some point and also sailing or coasting function with a very, very small battery. Interesting that they also now go the M halfway. Alternatively, there would be a 1.5 liter diesel also with 125 horsepower. So small engines. to the interior, pretty thick door handles, also with keyless entry function, door closing sound. Yeah, it sounds quite okay. Then, inside of the doors, this one, the ST line with sporty red contour stitches right there. It's a leather red cover, soft at the inside of the doors. Hardpick is just right here. There, of course, they try to save some money. Very shallow, this inside door um, pockets here, so I'm not sure if that holds a lot. Also, thin materials. ST line badge to give it a little bit more spice, definitely. And also, those are support seats you see with fabric on the inside. And I guess that should be leather red on the outside, yeah. Maybe some animals, I think they split sometimes animal skin and leather red parts, but you cannot really differentiate what's what. But the majority is definitely fabric. Interesting design idea. And then also with the red contrast stitches, again, the base seat would be having a little less shoulder support. This is still a small car. And first seating test is, well, I have to say, it is somewhat, you know, somewhat like in Ford Fiesta, there you feel the platform difference you sit a little bit higher yes so that's good that you sit a little bit more upright this will give you a little bit more comfort we have the seat all the way low the headroom i have is well, it gets really close i do exactly fit in here with one meters 86 or six with one but again that comes quite close especially with this panoramic roof so let's see we can also close this shade manually and you can also slide it open this panoramic roof but it's not properly powered here at the moment. So interior overview, you can also move that steering wheel 
up and down and in and out. And then you see those new 12.3 inch digital instruments. Unfortunately, the car is not properly powered at the moment. There we can show you too much of that. Um, maybe when we open and close the door, and maybe sometimes we can see, yeah, there it is, there's a visualization of the 12.3 inch. Oh, with a Puma. That's nicely done with that logo there. Brings some more emotional touch to this car. Why not? <laughs> Pretty interesting. Then this central screen there in the middle part. This, you know, is a little bit attached off there, but that's the way that you can easier control it here. Also, maybe, you know, do something while driving. And um, their new systems are actually quite good. There are better ones, yes, but they do the job definitely. Phone connection either via Bluetooth or there's also now on the mobile apps. You can actually also use Apple CarPlay or uh, the Android Auto. But so far we cannot use um, the car internal map when we have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto connected. Now what about the rear? When I'm sitting in the front, first of all, look, same ST styling than the front. This one, of course, they're now all hardback. And here the materials are rather simple with those Ford interiors. Interiors not really where Ford is leading. Definitely have to admit that. Then the rest styling also with those red contrast stitches. Well, you see, it looks a little bit more upright than in the Fiesta. But what about the space I really have when taking a seat behind me as I would be driving? Again, it's not a long car. The package is not too bad. I mean, 4 meters 19, but when you think about, for example, the Honda E, <laughs> yeah, we've just been sitting in that one, that was a better package. So he, I hit um, the back seat here with my knees, so cannot sit here with four tall adults after each other. Headroom, it does exactly fit, but I'm inside this rear panoramic roof, which you can also open close with this shade uh, very interesting so yeah a little bit cramped in here not too different than the one from the fiesta then you just need a bigger car or one with a better package let's open it right here with this hatch and wow what's that <laughs> interesting plant transport and that would be you know one thing you can do with this so-called mega box this is very interesting so this uh, um actually for something that can get wet so I just put out the plan you know for a second but that could be used for plant transport indeed and if you remove this cover here you can even use this lower screw here and open it and then the water rinses actually through and now to our conclusion for today with the Ford Puma well this new edition of that one I mean why not making it a little bit more cross crossoverish SUV-ish that's the contemporary trend and you know why not doing it in that way Definitely looks stylish and emotional from the exterior. Interior, I really like the Titanium X trim here today with those bright fabric seats, which also can be bought then with those removable seat covers. So that was pretty cool. Other than that, the interior is somewhat a weak part of this car. You don't have too much space, but then also it's, it's a small car. And of course, those fabrics are pretty, pretty cool at the inside of the doors. But then there are also some weak parts we found there, like with those rubber claddings and so on. Interesting also with the trunk with this new mega box. So I mean not sure what I would use it actually for But it's a definitely a very interesting approach also with those mild hybrid engines by the way The M have function is not only available for the bigger petrol engine But also for the smaller horsepower auto version forgot to mention that earlier. So both actually available with the M have Let's see how that one plays out if it will be lower in consumption because earlier tests with the Fiesta for example Usually we were, were quite high in the fuel consumption. Maybe the MHF can be a solution for that Like you know, what do you think about the new Ford Puma here? You like it here when it's a little bit crossover SUV -ish? if you of course can remember the old Puma as a comparison So thanks for tuning into that one here and also tune in to the next episodes